With President Erdogan on the verge of re-election, what comes next for what's left of Turkish journalism? Under the gun in Guatemala, an investigative magazine shuts down after a conflict with the powers that be. And reflecting tensions or creating them? The media's role in the geopolitical stare-down between Beijing and Washington. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and analyze how news gets reported. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, seems to have cemented his hold on power, coming out of round one of the election there, with a comfortable lead over his primary rival, Kemal Kilic Darolyu. The round two runoff is a week away, and the momentum is with the president. Over his two decades in office, Erdogan has taken an increasingly authoritarian approach to the Turkish media, and one news organization after another has succumbed. They've seen what's happened to the news channels and papers that have failed to fall in line, and they're well aware of how many Turkish journalists have ended up behind bars. This election has also served as a reminder that social media is no match for good old-fashioned news channels, that in Turkey, the mainstream media remain the biggest influencers of them all. Turks do not take their democracy for granted. Having lived through an attempted military coup as recently as 2016, they treasure their right to vote. Turnout in the first round of this election exceeded 85%, a figure other democracies would envy. But how does one square that with this? A mainstream media landscape where a campaign interview with the incumbent president Recep Tayyip Erdogan is broadcast simultaneously on 24 different channels, a privilege never afforded to the opposition. Turkey is a democracy, but let's say there are 20 channels and 18 of them you know, air Erdogan most of the time or the people that support him and tell about his greatness. The opposition gets its word out through social media, but big chunks of the population, especially the people who vote for Erdogan that come from less urban areas, they're not maybe into social media that, that much. So it's not rigged ballots. It's controlling the narrative through dominating the media. The uh, government's domination of the media is uh, very clearly measurable. 80% of the media is controlled by the government or the people linked to the government. In Turkey, news journalism is mostly conducted in news studios uh, with people talking to each other rather than having on the ground research or investigative journalism. So in this kind of journalism, uh, when you, the, most of the broadcast media is dominated by the government, you really hear one uh, story. A measure of that domination was provided by an opposition figure who was a member of Rutuk, Turkey's broadcast regulator. He tweeted that during the election campaign, the state-owned channel TRT Haber devoted a total of 48 hours of coverage to President Erdogan. Erdogan's main rival for the presidency, Kemal Kiric Darolyu, according to that same tweet, got 32 minutes. And while those numbers seem to align with what Turks were seeing on TRT and their TV screens in general, members of Erdogan's AK party simply reject them as fabricated, fake news. The argument that uh, Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu got less coverage than President Erdogan is not true. Erdogan also serves as a president, and uh, when there is international meetings, that gets a separate coverage. But as far as campaigning coverage is concerned, multiple parties in the opposition have their own channels, which are very, very well followed. We expect international journalists, when they ask a question, not just to take what the opposition argues, but to search the facts for themselves. Since first coming to office in 2003, former Prime Minister turned President Erdogan has consolidated power politically while reshaping the Turkish media space bit by bit, and not for the better. Scores of once critical news outlets have been intimidated, hit with huge fines, or been pressured in other ways into selling their businesses to supporters of Erdogan and his party. 
When Erdogan was first elected, the NGO Reporters Without Borders ranked Turkey at number 100 on its Press Freedom Index. It's now at 165th out of 180 countries. With so many journalists jailed or forced into exile, and most of the mainstream media in the AK Party's camp, opposition candidates resorted to social media to get their election messaging out. But those platforms have proven to be no match for the mainstream media muscle that Erdogan and his government have at their disposal. In Turkey, the current government dominates the media, leaving the opposition very little room. In order to appeal to young voters, the opposition put their message out on Twitter and platforms like TikTok. But this content often only reached opposition supporters and didn't make a big impact on pro-government voters. People in Turkey struggled to get balanced information from the opposition and the government. The number of Twitter users in Turkey is one of the top in the world. And that's why opposition parties led their campaign through social media. But that is also partly the reason why the government has been trying to control social media as much as they can as well. Thousands of people in Turkey have been prosecuted for insulting the president on social media. Uh, most of those people didn't go to jail, but some did, and it was a lesson for other people. Round two of the election is a week away having come up just short of the 50% he needed to win it all in round one, President Erdogan is the heavy favorite. With ultra-nationalist Sinan Oan no longer on the ballot, Kemal Kilic has torqued up the anti-refugee rhetoric, desperately chasing Oan's voters through videos like this one. A country already divided, with Erdogan accusing Kilic Darolyu of cozying up to Kurdish separatists, is about to grow even more polarized, socially and politically. When voters turn on the TV, they mostly hear Erdogan's propaganda. Opposition voters gravitate to opposition media outlets, so we see serious polarization here. The Erdogan campaign destroyed the legitimacy of the opposition. They used the fact that the People's Democratic Party, which represents the Kurdish movement, supported Kilic Tarolu to insinuate that the opposition was collaborating with terrorists. And that notion was reinforced by establishment media. In the second round, I think the government media will play into polarization even more uh, by pointing to the high proportion of votes uh, from the Kurds towards the opposition, uh, try to portray them as being in cahoots with the Kurdish militants, which will be difficult to shake off when you don't have much of a platform uh, to counter and people receive most of their news stories from broadcast media still. Uh, social media usually dominate some moments, wh whereas the broadcast media dominates uh, days and hours. Exactly one century ago, Kemal Ataturk founded the modern Turkish Republic, and a militant form of secularism became the hegemonic ideology of the state. Ataturk preached that Islam was holding Turkey back as he reoriented it to the West. Practicing Muslims were shut out of the public sphere, including Parliament. The headscarf was later banned. 20 years ago, Turks elected Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who promised to end that discrimination and turn Turkey into a more inclusive place for citizens of all kinds. But the old secular elite has been replaced by a new, more religious one which has transformed Turkey's media as well, in a way that has benefited Erdogan, if not the country, and its rich mix of people. 20 years ago, we had a media that was maybe looking down upon the religious conservatives. That was wrong. Erdogan abolished that, and Erdogan should be thanked for that. But now those media institutions have become Erdogan propaganda machines, which now demonize other segments of society. Ultimately, Turkey's problem is being a nation at war with itself.
whether it should be at a Turkish nation or conservative Islamic traditionalist nation. Well, it's both. That's actually the richness of Turkey. But right now, Erdogan is entrenching his power by demonizing certain segments of society. And that's not a good future. To Guatemala now, where the closure of a leading investigative magazine, El Periodico, serves as a grave reminder that media repression in the Central American country is growing worse. Flo Phillips is here with the details. This past Monday, El Periodico released its final edition, silenced by pressures that are part economic, part political. For nearly three decades, the magazine provided Guatemalans with hard-hitting investigative journalism, exposés of corruption under various governments. A crowd gathered on the steps outside the Supreme Court to hold a symbolic funeral for the outlet, reminding Guatemalans the crucial role played by the Fourth Estate. Que la amenaza al régimen de corruptos viene de que haya periodismo investigativo, periodismo que documente la corrupción. President Alejandro Yamate's government was elected three years ago. Since then, it's been the subject of more than 200 El Periódico investigations, stories on alleged connections between the government and narco-traffickers, as well as irregularities in the procurement of vaccines to fight COVID-19. Things escalated last year when the magazine's publisher, Jose Ruben Zamora, was arrested on charges that included extortion and money laundering. Many consider those charges bogus, an attempt to silence El Periódico, which the president denies. Señor Presidente, ¿existe la libertad de prensa en su país? Sí, es un caso de una investigación de extorsión, de lavado de dinero. Currently on trial, Samora tweeted that, despite the fatigue, the severe adverse conditions, the humiliation and the ridicule, he will not cease his fight for freedom and democracy in Guatemala. Adding that, without press freedom, there is no democracy. A warning issued from behind bars on the state of journalism in Guatemala. Thanks, Flo. The relationship is strained. The rhetoric is heating up between two of the world's foremost economic and military powers, China and the United States. Analysts would tell you they could see this coming. China's growing economy, its expanding sphere of influence, its more assertive approach to diplomacy amount to an implicit challenge to the U.S. and its dominance of global geopolitics. Sometimes the media narratives emanating from Beijing and Washington on issues like COVID-19 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine do not help. They can add fuel to the fire. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the tropes, flawed journalism, misreporting, and even misinformation coming from both sides of the Sino-American news divide. Breaking news tonight, the object floating over the northern U.S. Is it a Chinese spy balloon? What the Pentagon it was the beginning of February, and in the United States, a balloon had set off a media storm. A Chinese spy balloon sailing over America. An enormous spy balloon the size. Where is the balloon right now? The Pentagon believes the Chinese were not only trying to watch the U.S., but listen to. By all measures, this was a new story worth covering. At a time of high tension with the United States, the Chinese had floated not one, but up to four spy balloons into American airspace. The reporting was legitimate. The breathlessness and the hysteria were not. Experts say the spy balloon has a future and possibly an ominous one. They say it could be used as a weapons platform. There was a lot of coverage about the spy balloon saga in the United States. You know, by any objective standard, it might not be the most important story about China of the day, but that's what the public pays attention to. In terms of this balloon, are we in danger at present? Right now? We're in the throes of moral panic about China. We are. Uh, taking this a challenge, an issue that we should certainly be, be all very thoughtful about, but blowing it up and inflating it into an existential threat. We're freaking out about a spy balloon. We're falling over one another to see who can just be uh, more sort of vociferously critical. The saga of the spy balloon was a textbook example of how one misadventure by either side in the Sino-American Cold War could be blown out of proportion. The Chinese didn't help matters. 
，为什么能看见一万八千米高空飞行的气球，却对美国俄亥俄州上空的绿翼蜥毒蘑菇云视而不见？ Both China and the United States have used spy balloons in the past against each other and many other countries. The February balloons, though, were badly mistimed. At this point, China-U.S. relations are at a low ebb.、Uh, there's a lack of trust. Both sides believe that the other one is up to no good, and this prevents any kind of clear communication. The United States is on a mission to contain China geopolitically and economically. China is not a passive player in this. China is determined not to let that happen, and they're not going to be、uh, put off by the U.S. The United States and China have been circling each other for decades. It started with the declaration of China as a communist nation in 1949, its immediate annexation of Tibet, the U.S.'s war in Korea in the 1950s, all of which coincided with a nuclear arms race. There were bilateral spectacles. Like the so-called ping pong diplomacy of the 1970s, in 1972, Richard Nixon became the first U.S. president to visit Communist China. The Americans were already in a cold war with the Soviet Union, and Nixon wasn't looking for another fight. In the 50 years since, there have been flashpoints, such as the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 and the mistaken 1999 NATO bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. It's a tragedy. And it was an accident. Then came a period of increased trade, following Communist China's embrace of its own unique form of capitalism. China grew increasingly assured as a global power, and the bumps in the Sino-American road started to grow larger. We had the horrible plague come in from China. Boy, oh boy, what they cost the world! The COVID-19 pandemic saw a decidedly undiplomatic Donald Trump squaring up with a resolutely authoritarian Xi Jinping, and the war of words worsened, with media outlets on each side echoing Washington and Beijing. Chinese government officials now installing fences in Shanghai, blocking people from leaving their homes for fear that they'll spread COVID. On American airwaves. One key misunderstanding keeps cropping up. There's this notion that the voice of Xi Jinping controls everything in China,、uh, that his imprimatur has to be on everything, and, and this is nonsense. All you have to do is go on Chinese social media to understand that. Every day, there are all sorts of questions in China. You can express what you want individually on social media. But if you say to people, "Let's get together and hold them accountable," if you start stirring up what the government considers to be trouble, you're going to be in trouble. I think there's a really predominant idea in the United States, and it's helped along by the American media narrative on China, that it's a one-man state. And before I suggest why that might not be entirely accurate, I think it's important to place the blame pretty squarely on China for this.、Uh, China deliberately projects that image. It doesn't want ever to show any cracks in the facade. It doesn't want to show multiplicity of voices. It's not a monolith. It's an enormously complex society with many layers of government,、uh, where there are a lot of people who, quietly or otherwise,、uh, have dissenting, differing views. It's incumbent on us, as part of the media, to try to to understand that. That is easier said than done. Reporting in China is difficult. The official attitude towards foreign media has moved from wariness and caution to outright hostility. The high point of Western media presence in China was during the 2008 Beijing Olympics, when the country went through a period of uncharacteristic openness. Some strong reporting came out at that time, and it energized journalism, both domestic and foreign, from China. Things look very different now. A lot of journalists, especially journalists from the United States, face、uh, visa restrictions, surveillance in China, harassment from the police, and sometimes expulsion from the country.、Um, you know, the, the many U.S. journalists I talk to truly want to understand the country better and tell the story about the country. Unfortunately,、uh, even their benign motives are frequently perceived as a threat to the Chinese national security. When journalists go out in the field, they're not met with happiness. I mean, the local authorities、uh, show up and they do everything they can to prevent you from getting a story. Why? 
Are they hiding something? No, they're afraid. Your career in government can be ruined by one bad story. There aren't second chances in China. So you have a situation where on one side there are a lot of negative stories. This has alerted the local officials and they become afraid. So once again, an issue of trust. Given the restrictions on Chinese journalists when it comes to reporting bad news domestically, they have a pretty free hand when it comes to the United States. Across the domestic state TV network, CCTV, and the international broadcaster, CGTN, there's a distinct hint of schadenfreude in reporting trouble in the United States. In Chinese state media, the focus is on sort of uh, social issues, gun violence, uh, social disturbance in the United States, drug problems, suicide rates, etc., etc. In America, the use of weapons is becoming more and more popular. There's also a lot of stories about um, the United States double standard when it comes to international affairs, right? What is it about the United States to accuse other countries of violating human rights while there are grave hu human rights problems in the United States? States. One of the things that we don't understand about Chinese media is that most of it is also commercially driven. They are after attention, advertising dollars. They're not going to tell the story of ordinary, you know, firemen rescuing kittens in Iowa. They're going to talk about, you know, corrupt politicians, about school shootings, about black Americans being gunned down uh, by white cops. The Sino-American face-off was a long time coming. An ascendant and aggressive China and a belligerent America have been on a collision course for a while. With each disagreement and each misunderstanding, the opportunities for talking to each other are getting narrower. Instead, the two countries are talking at each other, and often at cross-purposes. And finally, it's in Russian, but it was born in the USA. A video that looks like a Hollywood trailer swathed in darkness, produced by the CIA, an attempt to recruit Russians as American spies. For a while now, the agency has used social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to appeal to Russian citizens. But this is among the CIA's first posts on Telegram, the messaging app that's popular in Russia for its uncensored news content. The diplomatic tit for tat, however, was quick in coming. The very next day, Washington released a statement condemning the reported arrest of a former employee of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. The Kremlin clearly thinks the trailer is trash. You be the judge. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Это та жизнь, о которой я мечтал. Тот путь, который я себе выбрал. Почему жизни одних людей ценятся больше, чем жизни других? И кто это решает? Быть героем — это значит выстоять. Но выстоять — это ведь не значит терпеть напрасно. Лучший способ удержать заключенного от побега – сделать так, чтобы он никогда не узнал, что находится в тюрьме. Истинная жизнь происходит там, где совершаются незаметные изменения в душах людей. Незаметные для моей страны, но не для меня. Я буду жить истинной жизнью. Это моя Россия. Это всегда будет моя Россия. Я выстою. Моя семья выстоит. Мы будем жить достойно, благодаря моим действиям.